before you sit down, uh, we are going to read our text for today. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. This will frame uh, our discussion for this morning. Now, I, Paul, myself, appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble among you in person, but bold toward you when absent. I beg you that when I am present, I will not need to be bold with the confidence by which I plan to challenge certain people who think we are behaving according to the flesh. For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. Since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the uh, demolition of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Let me pray. Father, you are good. We thank you for uh, an opportunity to open up your word. Um, I pray here in this moment that you would speak through me, that I... Uh, will decrease, and you, uh, Father, would increase. I pray, God, that uh, as we uh, step into the series, that we would step into it uh, with humility, um, with a posture of, of asking uh, way more than pointing fingers, and I pray, God, uh, that you would have your way. Uh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Uh, it's been a full weekend here in Nashville, has it not? Uh, I got a lot of stuff happening, right? Uh, Janet Jackson herself uh, was in town, right? Amen, right? No, no Janet Jackson, me and Christina, right? Let's go. That's about it. Y'all don't like, uh, appreciate good music, clearly. Um, we're speaking of, there was another concert happening, right? T. Swift was in town, right? I didn't say anything about bad music there. She's still here, right? There's something happening later on today, just blocking up more traffic, right? Uh, Oprah was here this weekend. Did you guys know that? A few people excited about Oprah. Trevor Noah was here, right? Listen, there's a lot of things happening in Nashville uh, this weekend, and us kicking off a series on deconstruction is just as exciting, right? You guys are way more pumped about this than I am, I'm, and I'm thankful, really thankful. Um, man, this is, uh, this is going to be tough, right? Over the next couple of weeks as we walk through uh, Scripture, it's going to be really tough. Now, I'll say this, uh, a couple things about this series before we, we jump in, okay? Uh, first and foremost, this is more topical, right? Uh, here at Proclamation Church, we practice what's called expository preaching, where we open up the Word of God and we go verse by verse. We look through big chunks of the Bible, uh, typically through books of, of the Bible, this is a little bit different, okay? Uh, topical means that we take a topic uh, and we uh, see what Scripture has to say about said topic, uh, and that's what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks, okay? Now, I know we're just kicking off this series, but surprise, surprise, next weekend we're taking a break from the series. Uh, my friend Peter Park, I told you guys about him a couple weeks ago, uh, he is going to be planting a church in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia and Proclamation Church, we are going to be supporting that church plant. And so he's flying into town. Uh, you know, it's going to be obviously on a weekend where uh, T. Swift isn't here, but um, he's going to come into town and he's going to preach for us. Uh, and I just want you guys to have an opportunity to meet him, okay? And then the following weekend, we are going to have my friend Carlos Lillette. He planted a church uh, down in Miami. He and I went through the church planting residency together. Uh, so you get to hear this sultry Venezuelan voice talk to us about doubt. I was like I said, Carlos, uh, you know, we're taking a break in a series for Peter, but we can't have two weeks in a row taking a break. And he said, I got you, papi, right? That's how he, that's how he talks. And I was like, I said, ooh, I like that. <laughs> Stop that. So he's going to be preaching on doubt uh, a couple weeks after. Uh, and then from there, we are going to cover uh, what I believe are three subjects for the next three weeks uh, that are typically why people have either uh, not necessarily deconstructed, but have uh, decommitted to following Jesus. It's because of these three heavy topics that we're going to talk about. Justice, women, and sexuality. Right? <laughs> right? Uh, so it's going to be... Uh, very challenging. Um, next week, I promise that we'll have the, the, the air on. It's a little warm up here. It's probably not as hot uh, out there as it is up here, right? Uh, very, very nervous. Um, but uh, I believe that as we walk through uh, this series, my prayer 
uh, is that the Lord would open up our hearts and our minds to receive what God's Word says, uh, that we come to these subjects with a lot of thoughts and ideas and ideologies, and we're going to talk about that. But what does it look like to take all those things as we just read in 2 Corinthians, those thoughts captive under the submission and obedience to Christ? That's what my hope is, right? So we're really going to dive into Scripture to let Scripture determine how we think about these these subjects, okay? Uh, And we're going to talk about why that is here in just a second as we break this down. But uh, if, if you're like me, and you want to kind of wrap your, your mind around some of these subjects, right, a little bit more than just what uh, I'm, I'm teaching on on a, on a Sunday, uh, I have about 20 books up here, not for you to take, uh, but for you to come and take a picture of, and each one of these uh, books actually covers the subject material that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks, okay? Um, some of them range from easy reading, 120 pages, all the way up to about 400 or so, okay? So some of them a little bit more heady than others, uh, but all great books that have helped uh, uh, determine and bring out the truth of Scripture in a way that it's easy to digest as we we navigate this stuff, okay? Uh, So if you want to just do some random reading, come up here, take some pictures. It'll be fun, I promise, okay? Now, uh, with all that being said, uh, there was a book uh, that I read a little over a year ago, um, and then as a staff, we read it, uh, that really has kind of helped kind of shape why we decided to to preach on this subject of deconstruction. It's a book by John Mark Comer called Live No Lies. Um, You guys know I I, I love John Mark. Um, I think that he is uh, a phenomenal pastor. He pastors in a in a really hyper-liberal area um, uh, in, the, in the West Coast, uh, Portland, Oregon, and how he thinks about a lot of the subjects that we're going to talk about, uh, super helpful, um, as he brings out the truth of Scripture in a lot of this stuff, right? So just letting you guys know out of the gate, I'm going to reference him a lot in this series, okay? Uh, not only am I referencing him a lot this series, uh, I'm referencing him a lot today, Okay, especially out of out of that book. So, uh, you guys ready? Let's let's strap ourselves in. Uh, this will be uh, good good stuff. Um, but in this book, "Live No Lies," John Mark Comer says this in helping us understand the topic of today. He says we live in the age of ideology, both on the political right and the left, and everywhere in between. And this is what he's getting at here. All ideologies begin with a truth, but then over time, we make that truth the whole thing that we kind of based how we live and operate off of. An easy example for us to see this take place is in the uh, the last century is the Russian uh, uh, Revolution. What started out by Marx and others as a critique of classism and a vision of society of equality and justice ended up being one of the greatest genocides in human history. The desire for a human utopia became a complete dystopia. Or the century before that, in our own country, what began as a revolution of liberty ended in the largest expression of slavery in human history. See, we're all just this mixed bag of donuts, if you will. We're atheists and and Christian and uh, uh, we're far from God or far from truth or not so much in between, but we're all made in the image of God. And in that, We all hold this desire for virtue and love and compassion along with every single one of us being fallen or broken. And whatever you want to call us in this idea, we are walking contradictions regardless of faith. All of us. Every single one of us, we have an ideology that comes with motivation. But here's the thing, family. Without God, we will ruin everything that we touch which then shows us that sometimes the ideologies that we understand as good, we turn into an ultimate. When you take something good, like freedom and justice and equality and politics or a number of other things, and you make those things ultimate, it becomes a disaster. Because then what happens, God is not in his rightful place. We essentially have made the thing in the place of God. We must understand that we were created to live in orbit around God, not vice versa. I heard it said this way. 
that in this decade, more people are leaving over church or leaving church over ideology and not theology. Where people are stepping away from the family of God, the community, not because someone is teaching that Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, but because they don't hold to a particular ideal that they have platformed as God. Guys, that should be challenging. The kids are loving it down there, right? They are loud. I didn't think we could hear that, but here we are. Guys, when ideology becomes ultimate, again, it's a disaster. When ideology becomes ultimate, instead of Jesus forming our identity and Jesus forming our ideals and Jesus forming our character and Jesus forming how we live and we think, we will fall. Christians on the right and the left are guilty of this. So let me be clear here. We all have an ideology. We're getting that, right? We have these ideologies in which we interpret how we see the world, how we see culture, how we see life, how we see stories and religion and social justice and cultural moments and so on and so forth. And if you don't believe me, look no further than the Christian nationalist movement that's mostly just a political religion running rampant. While some of the ideologies of today are new, the temptation to mix the way of Jesus, or as the writers of the New Testament said, the ways of this world, it's ancient. So if that's true, this is what I want us to understand today is this. The biggest temptation for Christians is not deconversion, which is essentially walking away from the things of Jesus, but ideological idolatry. We, we see this in, um, in Exodus, right? So Moses goes up Mount Sinai, he goes to the top, and he, you know, is uh, talking to God, and he's getting the Ten Commandments, right? And what happens? The, the nation of Israel kind of hanging around, they're like, yo, like, what's going on, right? So they take all their gold, and they melt it down, and then they form this golden calf to which they all begin to worship underneath, right? And, and essentially the way that, that Scripture says it is that they indulge in revelry, which is essentially just sexual promiscuity, right? And they say that this cattle, this, this idol is now Yahweh. And because of Yahweh, this is why they were doing what they were doing. Essentially what they're saying is I can do whatever I want as long as it's for my God, my understanding of Yahweh. Family, we live in a world that's full of opinion and information, but oftentimes bankrupt of truth and wisdom. And this is why Paul wrote to the church, the church in Corinth about Christian leaders of the church who are allowing the standards of the world to inform what was taking place in the church. And he's like, no, 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 that's not how we operate here. We need Jesus to change us. They were changing the faith in their teachings to conform to a worldly standard, and Paul was like, no. We take thoughts captive, and we put it under submission of Christ and who he is, not the other way around. And what typically happens in this phenomenon is that people form their own understanding of Scripture and begin to think of it in their own way in a process called deconstruction. Now, if I can offer up a definition of deconstruction that I think will be helpful for us as we continue in this series, and as we continue on, really, for the rest of our lives beyond, right, is this. You go and put it in there. Deconstruction is a crisis of faith that can lead to either a restructuring of Christian practice or values based totally on Scripture, or sometimes a total abandonment of Christianity altogether. I'll say that again. Deconstruction is a crisis of faith that can lead to either a restructuring of healthy Christian practice or values based on Scripture, or sometimes it's a total abandonment of Christianity altogether. Here's what I want you to see. Deconstruction doesn't necessarily lead to rejection. Deconstruction can also be a precursor to rejuvenation. And I say that because <clears throat> I want us to understand this because oftentimes when we hear the terminology deconstruction and where we are right now, we automatically think bad. We automatically think wrong. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Deconstruction does not automatically mean deconversion. It does not automatically mean deconversion. I remember a time uh, when I had this thought, this idea that Christianity was the white man's religion. 
When I, when I truly started walking with Jesus at age 16 and I really started getting into history and all these different thoughts, I had this idea that Christianity was the white man's religion. Why? Because Christianity was so, so influential in the slave trade here in America. There, there have been pastors and theologians and guys that we've quoted early on in church history that own slaves. That should rock our world. It's just like, yo, you knew the truth. And you was out here tripping like the rest of them. But what was going on? I, I think it's easy for us to, to look at those guys and, and cry shame, 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 which in reality is like, well, you had the truth of Jesus. You should have known better. But you have to also understand that these individuals were doing what? Living in the ideology of their time. Culture was doing it. And so for them, they're like, mm, this is part of what we do. This is how we operate. And it was when I began to express these frustrations of these people who should know better, weren't doing better, and the reality is Christianity can't really be for, for, for black people if this was the case. I had to have this dialogue and these conversations with people that I trusted, people who were patient with my questions, people who were kind towards me as I was dialoguing and trying to figure out something. And it's in those conversations, was in those relationships that I got a clear understanding of God and who he is and how I should not allow culture to misshape the Jesus that I place my faith in. In short, my deconstruction led to rejuvenation. Good thing. And the reason why that happened is because of what I shared already. We had people who were walking with me and patient with me, were kind. They invited dialogue and companionship. I wonder if we can do the same. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But this is important for us to understand when we undergo deconstruction because there's a possibility that we can step into this and shipwreck our faith. But we need to shift from an intellectual affirmation of a system of beliefs to putting into practice the teachings of Jesus. This is why I keep saying we're going to look to the Word of God. We've got to look to the Word of God. What God's Word says has to structure how we think about these different things. Easier said than done. And the reason why it's easier said than done is because we got relationships. We've got our own personal struggles. We've, we've seen people be hurt by the church. We're, again, we're going to talk about all this in just a second later on. But what I'm about to say, it might be mind-blowing to some of you. It may not be. But I want you to understand this for every single one of us, okay? God is big enough for your doubts and questions. So I, I, I don't want you to feel like you can't have questions. I don't want you to feel like that just because mama said it this way and now you're thinking about it a different way that you're wrong. God is big enough to handle the doubts and questions that you have. And so we see that there's a good type of deconstruction and there is a need for it. Every generation has a need for it. But there's an unhealthy way as well that I believe we need to be on guard for as we walk through this, okay? So this is what I'm getting at, okay? Next point here. Deconstruction, though it is challenging to all of our ideologies, can still prove to be necessary for us, okay? Even though deconstruction challenges our ideologies, it can prove to be necessary. I want to draw our attention to uh, two aspects in Scripture where we see this take, taking place, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7. Uh, we, uh, we come face-to-face -face with what's called the Sermon on the Mount, Okay? Jesus is, is teaching all these things. As a matter of fact, John Stott, he says this about the Sermon on the Mount, that it's the nearest manifesto that Jesus ever uttered, for it is his own description of what he wanted his followers to be and do. I love that. In this section, particularly in chapter 5, Jesus mentions six different times, you've heard it said, but I tell you. Essentially, what he was doing is he was talking to the Pharisees because like, yo, these Pharisees had an understanding of the law and how it shaped their ideals at the time. And Jesus was saying, yo, yo, how you're thinking about that? Yeah, it's probably not as right as you think it is. 
In fact, this is actually what it means. He was challenging their ideals. You see, the Pharisees had created all kinds of ingenious ways of working around the intention of God's word. For example, they found ways to harbor bitterness and hatred towards their neighbor while remaining innocent in their own eyes in regards to murder. They could lust after their neighbor's wives, but as long as they didn't commit adultery, they were okay. They felt themselves to be holy and technically speaking, right? But generally, they felt justified by blurring the edges of truth. They would swear by this object, and even though when they wouldn't come through with what they were promising, as long as they didn't swear on the wrong things, that somehow they were people of integrity. And so Jesus is saying, all right, all right. You heard it say this. This is actually what it means. You may not have never murdered because you heard don't murder someone, but guess what? If you harbor bitterness and hate in your heart towards someone, you're just as guilty as murder. You, you may not have committed the act of adultery, but you've been looking at someone's wife that wasn't yours. Guess what? You're still just as guilty. What, what the Pharisees operated in was this ideology of outward appearance. I need to look good. And when, you, when people saw how they operated, they were like, okay, this must be the way. But what Jesus was saying is like, no, no, no. I'm trying to get at the heart of the matter. It's not, I'm, I'm not here for outward appearances. I want what happens on the inside to direct your outward appearance. I'm, I'm getting at the heart here. Jesus had to deconstruct the ideologies there at the time. Fast forward into the New Testament. Uh, Pastor Doug spoke on this a little bit last week. But in Galatians, you had the church of Galatia. You had these Jewish Christians, and you had these Gentile Christians. And the Jewish Christians were saying things to the Gentile Christians like, hey, the gospel is good, but you also need to do these things. You also need to practice these Jewish customs and ideologies. You need to be circumcised. You need to make sure that you ain't eating no, you know, no pork, no bacon, Right? And all the Gentile Christians was like, really, no bacon? Oh, no. And Paul is catching wind of this, and he says, he says, yo, it's not the gospel plus other stuff. That's, that's not the word of God here. In, in fact, he says in Galatians chapter 1, like, yo, you guys are believing another gospel. <laughs> this ain't even a real thing that you're committing to. He also goes on to say in Galatians chapter 2, 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law by a whole nother means, by another type of practice, then Christ died for nothing. And he's like, that's not the case. What he's saying is that their current Jewish ideologies don't hold merit to the whole gospel of Jesus, deconstructing their ideas, deconstructing their thoughts. You're going to have to lay down your cultural norms for the sake of understanding that Jesus is building a multi-ethnic church that your customs don't apply to these new family members coming in. Deconstruction. Fast forward to our American history. I already mentioned this, but we cannot ignore the history of our nation. We practice slavery of Africans and Native Americans. The thing that made this so heartbreaking People who identified as followers of Jesus operated this way. Mind-blowing. But again, why? It's, it's the cultural thing. It's the ideology of the day. And so who were they to step outside of the norm? So the American church participated in it. However, you cannot look at the Bible's ethical codes and see how it did not challenge the ideology of slavery. In his book, in the book, Christianity and Freedom, in his particular chapter, Kyle Harper, uh, his chapter was titled Christianity and the Roots of Human Dignity in Late Antiquity, says that one of the first people to ever challenge slavery as an institution was a Christian church father, Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory was born uh, around the, the death of Constantine, and he raged against the sinful presumption of enslaving people created in the image of God. He would say, if God does not enslave what is free, who is he that sets his own power above God's? 
As Kyle Harper notes, it is no small distinction to be the earliest human to have left an argument for the basic injustice of slavery. Essentially what he's saying is like, this guy was sticking his neck out. That when the ideals were happening around the culture, he's going to be like, you know what? I'm looking at the Bible, and it don't say that. I'm calling foul on that. One of the first ones to do it. And this was a welcome development, right? A, a, a Christian argument against slavery itself? Guys, that is a natural outgrowth of the ethics of the Bible, the fact that you and I are created with dignity, worth, the imago Dei. The image of God has been imprinted on every single one of us. So there should be no reason whatsoever that we don't look at someone with the same worth and value that God has already given them. And so we see it, and it's like, duh, that makes sense. Christian thought was unfortunately not universally, uniformly anti-slavery. It wasn't until the 1800s that they were finally like, all right, hey, maybe we should chill out. It took you long enough. Because the reality is scripture spoke to this. Every one of these instances that I just mentioned, healthy deconstruction is needed, is necessary. However, what we see take place often and why we decided to have this conversation as a church in the first place is this. We oftentimes see the opposite of healthy deconstruction taking place. Essentially, it's unhealthy deconstruction. So write this down. Healthy deconstruction must have God's word at the center, not our culture or our ideals. This is when we start getting to some meat and potatoes. Hopefully you brought the, the A1 sauce, okay? Now, much of what we're about to cover, uh, I already said this, live no lies. Uh, he talks about this in there. Um, John Mark Comer preached a sermon uh, about two years ago on this subject. It's titled Deconstruction the way of Jesus and the ideologies of the world. You can find it on YouTube. It's way better. He does a way better job than I do. Uh, than, I, than I do. Yeah, I was about to say than I does. You see, this is why he is better than me. But before I share some of those thoughts, this is what I want us to be on guard for here at Proclamation Church, okay? There is a trend among Christians of analyzing the Bible through a cultural lens, this is what the Apostle Paul is warning us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You got to take these thoughts captive and do what? Put them under the rule and reign, obedience of Christ and who he is. The same thing is happening today. Listen, it's already clear. Deconstruction is not new, but the cultural climate in which we live in most definitely is. Theologian Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, he says it this way, visit many good books, but live in the Bible. What we see more often than not when it comes to deconstruction is the opposite of that quote. In the name of making Jesus more relatable or cool or, or, or a way to, to fit our ever-evolving ideologies of our world, we live in books and culture, but visit the Bible only to affirm said ideologies. Listen, when some Christians, not all Christians, but some Christians go through deconstruction, it is difficult to take their claims seriously because the questions they have don't come from a place of love of God, love of the scriptures, love for the church, or even a love of Jesus. They often come from a place of cultural critique informed by culture, not scripture. Hopefully, you're seeing a trend thus far. The word of God is important. We can't have this conversation without the word of God. Plain and simple. And this is, this is what's going to be so challenging over the, over the next few weeks, is I'm going to say things that are going to ruffle feathers. I'm going to say things that you're going to be tempted to send me an email, okay, or text message. I'm going to say things that you're going to be tempted to be like, you know what? I'm out. I'm going to kindly ask you to hold off on the emails and the texts <laughs> and don't leave yet. Because our hope is that you begin to see that this isn't 
uh, my opinion or my thought, I'm wanting to appeal to the word of God. Let us let that be the determining factor, okay? Scripture. And the reason why I make that plea to you is because I think our natural tendency is to live in many good things, then visit the Bible later. We embrace many good things that the world will offer us and then only visit Scripture. Guys, if that's how we operate in these difficult subjects, that is unhealthy and it's grounded in the elevation of one's self. It's grounded in hubris and deep-rooted desire for the world to like me and my version of Jesus. John Mark in his sermon says that deconstruction is the middle of the maturing process. And at some point, that deconstruction has to end. What he is saying that we should grab onto is this. Deconstruction is not the end goal. It's not. He actually goes on to share that religion aside, developmental psychologists suggest that there's a three-stage process in our childhood, okay? There's deconstruction, uh, there's construction, deconstruction, and then reconstruction, okay? This is what he means by that. Construction is you have your family of origin, right? Where they give you the, the do's and the don'ts, the yes ma'ams and the no sirs. You have an understanding of how to live, think through what's right and wrong, okay? We, we operate in this way. We are developing ourselves into what it means to be mature adults and how to operate in this world, construction, okay? But eventually we come to stage two where there's deconstruction, where maybe the way that mom and dad used to do things probably ain't the best way. That was just like, man, I don't know if I rock with that anymore. Why? Because I've experienced life now. I've began to not think through or see the world through the lens of mom and dad, but the lens of experiences, the lens of how I've operated, the relationships that I've developed, that, that because I have a love for this person over here and because of what I grew up and they were saying this, it kind of goes against this relationship that I now, I now have, something's wrong. Something's not computing. And then we begin to deconstruct. We begin to ask questions. We begin to wonder that how I've lived and how I've operated, maybe it wasn't right. But we need to understand that even in those thoughts, those thoughts are still corrupted by sin, right? That we've got to figure out, man, what's going on here? Which then leads to stage three, which is actually reconstruction. We can reconstruct a, a worldview based on the best wisdom that we see. Past generations, right? And we own those thoughts with humility, with an open mind, wisdom, strong conviction. And as we rebuild this worldview to live by, we don't need to start with a blank slate because we've already had the lessons given to us early on in construction, right? Do you see this full circle? And then we begin to see, well, other people made mistakes. Now we know not to do that anymore. Go, I know I keep using the illustration, but slavery. We look at that now and be like, yo, how goofy. <laughs> we will never do that again, right? We, we better not. Why? Because we've reconstructed, reconstructed. We now have a better framework that we live in. When reconstruction takes place, we are entering into being naive 2.0 meaning it's almost like what you see in a child. They're so happy. They now know how to operate. They remain happy and maybe somewhat a little oblivious, right? French philosopher Paul Ricoeur writes that this takes place for adults who have walked through the desert of skepticism, the wasteland of humanism, philosophy, and deconstruction, and then with age, experience, wisdom, and scars, through the gambit of emotions, these adults arrive back at a posture of humility and trusting joy. Now for us, I would say many of us live in a stage two culture. And what I mean by that, there are slants in this stage two type culture, both liberal and conservative. Some of us grew up very conservative in this stage one culture, right? Think uh, turn or burn mentality, right? That type of slant doesn't provide space to ask hard questions. 
It doesn't provide space to wrestle with doubts. It's either get on the train or get left. And oftentimes that type of thinking to my conservative family members in here is not the right type of thinking. It's not. But not to just look past, there's also the liberal side as well, where essentially what we see in this progressivism is essentially it just repeats the trending linguistics of culture and various ideologies. This is what I mean by that. People will, without much thought, accept almost any idea that's full of contradiction and bias. Their reasoning? Well, everyone on the internet is saying it, so it must be true. (laughs) Or it really doesn't make sense, but it feels right to me, so that must be good. And just as the conservative culture doesn't allow space for doubt or questions, neither does the progressive side either. Because as soon as you begin to question on the other side as well, you're labeled or shamed or canceled if you question or challenge the status quo. Overall, as a whole, I would say that we are all in this stage two culture. A lot of people eventually move through this because you can only stay fervent for so long in this posture. Because then you get stuck in the kind of limbo where you become more against things than you are for actually standing for anything. You have more doubt than faith, more skepticism than confidence, which means this. If if many of us are in that space, very few of us are in the stage three of reconstruction. We have been constructed, we have deconstructed, and now we've reconstructed. There are very few that actually live in this space, and my hope is that many of us begin to move into this space. And the reason why, because many people who are in this space have this deep conviction about God and the scriptures and the church, and reality has shown them that they have a high capacity of human experiences, and they see just how fragile life is and how people come with all these different questions and hurts and thoughts and ideas, and there's not an easy answer for people. These people who have reconstructed, reconstructed, these are the people with deep compassion for others and humanity in their lives, and they have this burning conviction. And while these individuals may be small in number, family, they exist. And my hope and prayer is that more and more people like that would exist here in our church. It's where we truly can become a space where people feel safe and comfortable to talk about their doubts in big group. And not worry about what somebody else has to say about their thoughts. That they're not going to have stones thrown at them. They're going to have a welcome community with an open life and an open Bible. To say, let's walk through this together. All that to say, deconstruction is not the end goal, but it is a phase that you are meant to pass through. And so I'll say this. I know historically for those in this room right now, who would say that you were deconstructing some thoughts and ideas that you have about the church, guess what? The church hasn't been a safe space for you, and I'm sorry that it hasn't been. I'm sorry that you've had to navigate a lot of this stuff alone with scars and struggles. And leadership and those who you've placed your trust in have let you down by shooting down your questions. Again, my hope is that would not be the case here. That you can bring those doubts, bring those questions, and know that you are loved. You don't have to be alone in your doubts because no one should be alone as they venture this desert of skepticism and questions and deconstruction. Let's walk through it together. Let's allow the word of God to be our guide as we walk through it together to see what thus saith the Lord. So all that to say, don't give up. Don't give up on your search and and where you are. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12 says this, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Essentially what Paul is saying here is this, there's a time when you don't know everything. You don't have all the right answers. 
There are going to be things where respectfully and lovingly we're going to walk together through Scripture that even once the book is closed, you're going to be like, but I'm still confused. But I still don't get it. And what Paul is saying is like, guess what? That's life. <laughs> That's part of the beauty of faith, that there's going, to be a come, there's going to come a time when I'm face-to-face with Jesus, and I'm like, oh, that's what you were doing. Oh, that's what you meant. Because back in Nashville, bruh, I was tripping. It makes sense now. Thank you for that. The time is coming. When the Nemean time family, we're patient with each other. We're gracious towards each other. Because that's what Jesus is for us. And so in your deconstruction, John Mark points out that there's a both external factors and internal factors when it comes to deconstruction. And I believe that that speaks to where many people have been or currently are in, okay? Now, there's a graphic that I straight up copy and paste from their stuff. Uh, we're going to put it on here now, external deconstruction. I realize now that I'm looking at it uh, that those pastel colors uh, don't really help the eyeballs. I apologize beforehand, uh, but if you got a phone, you can take a picture, zoom in, and it'll be helpful, okay? Um, but we see three different types of external deconstruction. What, what John Mark is saying is that these factors typically have played a part in why people deconstruct, okay? Three different things, right? So you see at the bottom, my uh, bottom left, your bottom right, cheap grace and low discipleship. Essentially, that terminology, G, uh, cheap grace, Grace came from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? And, and essentially what Dietrich Bonhoeffer is talking about is that there's this idea that us as Christians, that we can just kind of step into the movement of Jesus without any real repentance, without any real ownership of the fact that we have sinned, that we've dropped the ball, that we're not as great as we think that we are, that maybe we don't have all the right answers, that maybe we could be thinking about our ideals and stuff incorrectly, and that because that's us, right, there's a whole opposite side of that where it is like, nope, I'm right. And there's no one calling us out. Cheap grace. Cheap grace. And so then he also talks about this low discipleship. Essentially what this looks like, it's a hyper focus on getting big and seeing all these people come to know Jesus, right? <clears throat> having all this flashy stuff, having people come in. But then once the conversion happens, there's nobody walking with this individual to see them come to look like Jesus more and more. And so because there's no discipleship, there's no walking with said individuals, as soon as something happens, we're thrown off. So the challenge for us here is if our Sunday morning gathering is our greatest means of discipleship, guess what? According to this, we're in trouble. He doesn't end there with, Cheap grace and low discipleship, though, he talks about ascendant secular ideologies. Essentially what he's getting at, again, on, on both sides of the coin, politically, religiously, there's this quasi-religions that attempt to replace the ways of Jesus with a feel-good message of Jesus. Secular ideologies where you can have Jesus and have the things that make you happy as well. That you kind of dip your toe in this, but also be living in this. And these quasi-religions, these secular ideologies, have been discipled into us by our consumption of digital, digital media, has been educated to us through pop culture. And because we see these things, we believe these things, leaves no room for real truth. Which then we see at the top here, broken trust from spiritual leaders. There's a tragic breakdown of spiritual leadership. Because leadership is flawed and has broken trust, all trust in pastors in the church is now completely broken. That because of what one person has done or what we've seen online or whatever the case may be, we look at that and be like, ah, the church is a mess. And if they can't get it right, then neither can I, so I'm walking out. We see these external factors of deconstruction and involves low discipleship, cheap grace, dominant secular ideologies, and broken trust. Then he takes it a step further and say, well, there's also these internal factors as well. We got this graphic here. The one that you see on the bottom left, you're right, lack of fear of God. Essentially, you have this understanding of God and who he is, but there's no level of truly worshiping him as God. 
that you know that there's an ultimate power out there somewhere, but he just doesn't dictate how you live your life. Who, who is he that can tell me what to do? That we don't understand the, the love that he has for us, and because of his love, it calls me to be obedient to what he's calling me to do. So you have a Christianity without a cross resulting in undisciplined flesh that gets coddled and spoon-fed rather than being overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit, which then leads to this wounded heart. Listen, almost no one who has deconstructed their faith was not first wounded by a spiritual leader, a religious parent or guardian, their family group of origin, a church, or some type of Christian experience. Almost every single person who has stepped into deconstruction that has led to deconversion, that has been their story. Wounds in the church happen. It's unfortunate which then leads to the next thing we see, digital inputs and low scripture. Essentially what he's getting at there is that we have our mind filled with digital inputs rather than saturated in scripture and prayer. So the question I have to ask you, just like I asked the group earlier, man, what do you do in your spare time? Man, I love TikTok. I do. Uh, we put the kids to bed and you can find me on my phone looking at TikTok, scrolling aimlessly, so funny. I can't tell you the amount of uh, videos I just send out because I want people to laugh with me, okay? TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, basketball, all that is occupying my time right now. Full transparency, when I was kind of writing this out, kind of did this like compare and contrast, man, I find myself on all these digital uh, platforms way more than I do in Scripture. That's me confessing that to you. I wonder if anyone else would be so honest. That's how we operate, guys. Thank you, Katie. No one else wanted to. That's how we operate, guys. The Barna Group conducted a study where they found that strong Christian millennials, which is the majority of the ones in the room, not to exclude those who are not millennials, but Christian millennials consume over 3,000 hours of digital content a year. Only 150 of those hours is Christian content. That's about a 20 to 1 ratio. The, the entire premise of James K.A. Smith's book, You Are What You Love, speaks to this very thing, that you essentially become what you give your attention to. So if your ratio of secular ideas to Jesus is 20 to 1, that's going to have a destructive effect on your faith. And if that's true, there should be no wonder why we are struggling for truth. Because we don't contend for it. We don't spend time with it. So you've got the external factors and you have the internal factors. It involves a lack of trust and honor for God, trauma or wound that remains open, and then accelerated by the overabundance of secular media with low regard for Scripture. I think everyone in this room has someone that they love or care for that hasn't just deconstructed but has completely destructed where they have completely walked away from the faith. And here's the thing. I love the city that we live in. I love Nashville. I know people would love to say that Nashville is like the buckle of the Bible belt because it has so many churches, right? Uh, which it definitely does. But more and more what's happening in our city, more people are celebrating when people's faith has been destructed because of the historic impact negatively that the church has had in society. People are walking away in droves. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, man, what are we doing in the midst of that? The loss of cultural favor towards Christian faith has really wrecked a lot of people. And the reason why is because we all want to be liked. And if you don't, I'll, I'll confess, I do. You know how awkward it is for me when I'm having conversations with people who, you know, I'm meeting for the first time or, you know, out in the wild or something like that. And they're like, what do you do for work? And I'm like, Ugh. Real talk, I, I cringe a little bit. I'm a pastor. Oh, okay. 
And the reason why I cringe is because, man, I, I don't want to be labeled as archaic or on the wrong side of history, whatever the case may be. So it's like, man, how do I have this conversation? And I know I'm not the only one that feels that way. As soon as someone says, I'm a follower of Jesus, you're put in a box. When that happens, what do we do? What Paul is telling us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's warning the Corinthians that we could read much of ourselves into this today. When culture begins to set the standards for your convictions, you are no longer dealing with Christian faith but secular ideology. That I need to put myself in a position where it's like, man, I don't care what people think. I understand that I can be a, a, a label or, or categorize, but my hope is that as you see me live my life, that you realize that the box that you think Christians belong in actually does not. Because we follow a Jesus that changes lives. That he calls the broken, that he calls the hurt, that he calls the disenfranchised into the family of God. And he does that by his grace. So Christian, if you're in here, you're caught in deconstruction. If you find yourself making compromises to truth, it means you're deconstructing in an unhealthy way. That you need to in turn examine the authority of scripture in the church, not through a worldly lens, but through God's word itself. And listen, maybe it feels right now that I'm coming at you a little bit hot. Listen, hear my heart, okay? The gospel is convicting and it's correcting to all of us. It is. What I want you to see is this. We simply need to come back to the ways of Jesus and we understand the ways of Jesus by looking at God's word. So it does not matter where you land on the political script, uh, spectrum, left or right, conservative, liberal, whatever language you want to put to it, what is the ways of Jesus and what does it look like for us to live in those ways here in this city? It's difficult. Our, our city is a little bit different from the rest of the state, right? We are a little bit more far left. And for someone deconstructing, it's even harder since culture celebrates the destruction of faith. I think it's even harder when you've been raised in a more conservative church environment and then moved to a place like Nashville. There's a definite danger of ultimately going from Christian to progressive Christian and then landing in post-Christian where deconstruction leads to destruction. There are people who are floating around out there and it hurts to see them walk away from the truth. And this is where I hope to encourage us today. For those who are intentionally following the ways of Jesus, we can't go about giving our faith to others the same old way that we used to. We have to show a radical love. We have to show a radical life change. We have to show people the truth of Jesus from God's word, plain and simple. We must bring people into a relationship with Jesus a Jesus who loves them so much that when they realize that for themselves, the call to come and die to self and to die to ideologies and to die to culture becomes more tangible because they realize that Jesus first died for them. How are we living that truth out? So where do we go from here? Well, I would say for starters same grace that saves us is the same grace that sustains us. We need that sustaining grace in this. We need to be sustained in these conversations, and we need that more now than ever. For some of you, you may be on the brink of stepping away from the ways of Jesus because of doubts, because your relationships with people who you believe the Bible seems to belittle or disenfranchise, or maybe you think your questions or doubts disqualify you from the love of Jesus. This is my hope for us that we will see there is more to Christ than meets the eye. That we will see, like Matthew 17 said, that knowing Jesus and his kingdom is like the guy who comes up on a treasure in the field and he sells 
all of his belongings, everything that he has, so that he can buy this field to have this treasure. This treasure is rich. Scripture would go on to say that it's an unsearchable riches. That we have an opportunity to know Jesus deeper, but we got to dig for the treasure. We can't just be like anymore, well, my pastor said it on a Sunday, so we've got to read and research and spend time with God for ourselves so that we understand what we believe, and then while we're doing that, we begin to treasure it more deeply because we see the love that he has for us. I promise you, family, it's worth it. It's worth it. Amen? Let me pray. Father, we, uh, we need you all the time, uh, but we definitely need you as we walk through this series. Be with us. Give us, again, uh, ears to hear, eyes to see, open hearts to receive what your word has to say. I pray, Father, that as we leave out of here, that we would be convicted in the right ways, be challenged in the right ways, that you would point us to truth in the things that are said and done here over the next few weeks. As we leave out of here, give us through the power of your Holy Spirit the ability to proclaim the excellencies of Christ Jesus in all things that we say and do. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Fan, why don't you stand to your feet? As you're doing that, our prayer team is coming up. There's something that I uh, didn't share uh, that I do want to share. Over the next few weeks as we're walking through this series, um, again, uh, going to ruffle some feathers. Some toes are going to be stepped on. Uh, the thing that I want you to ask yourself as you potentially get frustrated uh, is this. Why does this bother me? Why does it bother me? And as you're asking yourself that question, take the, that concern, that thought, and bring it to the Word of God. And if you're holding that up in this mirror and what you see in God's word is different than the things that you're frustrated about, the loving challenge is it may not be the word of God. It may be something going on in your heart. And so prayerfully, 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 I really want you guys to be praying in this series um, because I believe that God can, is going to do something amazing in our midst, um, and my hope is that you're around to be a part of that. But it's going to be tough. Okay? So I'm praying for you. Pray for yourself. Pray for your boy. Let's do this thing. Okay? We love you. Go and proclaim. We'll see you next week.